Okay, so we're just jumping into a question. Spider silk. Okay, so we've got this is a strong and flexible natural fiber. It's as human as, as a possible fiber for protective clothing. What? Okay, we're not necessarily there yet. It's strong and flexible. Yep, the handout is available from the group tutoring session page on the button there at the top. Scientists have genetically modified a range of organisms to produce spider silk. Therefore, what, what type of molecule is spider silk? What type of biological molecule is spider silk? What can we infer from this? Yeah, it's a protein. OCR and NXL need to have distinction between fibrous and globular proteins. Yeah, it's highly likely to be a fibrous, it's strong and flexible, so natural fiber. But yeah, we can infer from this, it's a protein. Um, including goats and plants such as alfalfa. Okay. A gene for spider silk is copied. A gene for resistance to antibiotic A is also copied. The flow diagram shows some of the stages in the genetically, genetically modifying alfalfa plants. So here we're looking at the alfalfa plants, not the goats. Where were the goats? Goats were up here. Probably a similar process, but this is about the alfalfa plants to produce spider silk using the copy genes. An enzyme. When I'm in gene technology, there are there's not that many enzymes that we are expected to know the specific names of. We are expected to know that most biological reactions, in fact, we basically assume that all biological reactions are catalyzed by enzymes. Those that we need to know, amylase, maybe maltase, lipases in general, proteases in general, but no specific ones. There's not that many in the ATP synthase would be one. There's not that many. In gene technology, there's a couple. Um, we talked about some of them last week. But again, so what is the enzyme? Am I expected to know or not? Well, we can't tell up to this point, but we'll see. An enzyme is used to join copy genes to the antibiotic resistance marker to form a pair of joined genes. So it's good to visualize these things, especially with these flow diagram type questions, a bit of exam technique. So if I use, let's say red is my spider silk gene, and let's say orange is my antibiotic gene, um, they might have a little bit of regular DNA, like non-coding DNA between them. And typically we're talking about genes which are gonna be double-stranded. So maybe let's draw them in as double-stranded. So I'm just like trying to visualize this as I go. That's it's going to help me shape the question. Okay, then we have plasmids are cut open. Okay, again, what's the enzyme here? In the background, in my head, is like I'm thinking, what's the enzyme here? What's the enzyme here? Okay, well, these are going to be questions in the coming up. So, but in the back of your brain. Do you know them? Do you not know them? Um, so these are cut open plasmids, so the genes can be inserted into the plasmid. What word would we use for the, the plasmid here? The plasmid is acting as the thing, which is moving DNA from one place to another. What, what term do we give to the thing that moves DNA? Exactly, this is the vector in this case. Other vectors can be viruses. You, and OCR, they, I have seen liposome but I don't really know how they work. And there's no questions on them, which is why I don't know how they work. So let's um, not worry about them for the time being. Okay, so the plasmids are placed inside of Agrobacterium tumefaciens, which is a bacteria. So we've got the genus and we've got the species, which are then exposed to antibiotic A. I think, well, why are they doing this? Well, where have we seen antibiotic A before? Well, this in my diagram was the orange, the antibiotic resistance. Surviving bacteria, let's just take bacteria here, are used to infect the cells of an alfalfa plant. No mechanism there. It's just they get infected. Where in the alfalfa plant does the gene end up? Where? 
where does this gene go? Where in the cell would I find it? Yeah, absolutely, Steph, in the nucleus. That's where, that's where we want it to go. I'm sure some of them probably end up dead in the cytoplasm, gobbled up by lysozymes just as a foreign material, but mostly that's where we want it to be. We want it to be in the nucleus so it can be, well, the, the overall game is here to get the alfalfa plant to do transcription and translation to make the protein. That's what we want it to do. And in order for it to make the protein, the DNA has to be in the nucleus. Okay, so the infected plants are grown on agar containing IAA. So now this is taking us to another topic. Spider silk is extracted from the plants. No specific mechanism for doing that. It would just told that that's what's happening. Okay. Again, if those of you are joining us, reading the question should be hard work. Our brain should be trying to, well, what is the enzyme? What have they done? What haven't they done? Why have they done that? Why have they used an antibiotic? Why did they only choose the ones that survived? These are the kinds of questions that you want to be analytical when we're taking, when we're approaching questions. Obviously on this page, there are no questions here. We are just given a page of info. And it's not a case of, well, I'll browse, skim this, get to the question, and then I'll go back and read it properly. That's not great technique. You want to be trying to fill in the gaps as you're approaching, as you're reading it through for the first time. Okay. Kamal Moed has explained. Three marks. We have to give reasons. That's what explain means. So we're looking for reasons, ideally three of them. How an enzyme is involved. Wow, this is a weird, weird wording. Okay, I'm going to keep explain there. Explain how an enzyme is involved in joining the two different genes together in stage one. Uh, this is a perfect question for rephrasing the question. That your job as the student doing the exam is to get this nugget of the question, part one, really clean in your brain. So I'm going to give you probably a minute, a bit less. So what do we think this means? We're gonna re reword this question in such a way that it's a, what the hell do we think this means? We've got to, if we don't have clarity over what the question is demanding of us, we're gonna end up with waffle. We're gonna end up with stuff that isn't likely to get these three marks, okay? So I'm gonna just give you a minute, just, just looking at point one. I want you to internalize that question. I'm going to take it off the screen and then you're going to write me your version of what you think this question is demanding us to do. It's a quite a challenging one, this. Let me know when you're done. Doing this well, probably, if I had to put my money on it, the most important A-level biology exam technique piece that happens, that, that you have to learn. This is a not a very well-worded question, I don't think. Explain how an enzyme is involved. Yuck. Any takers? Anyone done? You want more time? Tavia's done. Josh is done. Okay, so, so write out the question into the chat as you understand it to be. I'm going to go with, okay, well, I remember, let's just go back to stage one. An enzyme is used to join two bits of DNA together. Really, that's it, right? That's, that's, that, that's, the, that's the nugget in stage one. If we were really paying attention when we were analyzing question one, I already knew that. I didn't have to go back, but I suppose for the sake of the record, that's 
you would probably go back and double check at that stage. So I would say name the enzyme that joins two double stranded DNA frags, fragments together. I always just write fragments. Probably the name is going to give me one mark, which is missing from, it's just a badly written question. It's really, then it's like, describe how it works, how it, how it, how it works. Explain how an enzyme is involved. So and maybe we can then, what's the role of the enzyme? And in from experience, what bonds does it either make or does it break? And obviously it kind of depends on what the enzyme is. In this case, we're joining together, we're making bonds. Okay, so really good there. Josh, you said state the enzyme and how does it work? What, what is its function? Even though this is quite an advanced skill. In the beginning, the first thing we have to do is identify that the command word is explained and that we have to, in theory, in theory, that there should be three reasons should be the three marks. This question is not really an explain question. When we really break it down, it's like, it's name or state, the enzyme. I think that's going to get us a mark. And then some functional points about how it works. Which enzyme joins together and how? Very nice, Steph. Excellent. Yeah. What is the enzyme and what does it do? Yeah, pretty much. I think you've all done a really nice. It was an Excel question. 100% this was an Ed. Their use of command words is negligent, in my opinion. They are, they pub literally, they have published documents that say explain means reasons are required. It's done. They print that. That's their choice. They have to meet certain assessment objective quotas. How they end up with this, I just do not know. But it's good. It's it's kind of it's a good test of our ability to understand the question, which is so much available biology. Okay, now now that we've understood the question, what do we think the answer is? So let's do that. I'm going to give you. We've done a lot of analysis here. I'm going to give you two minutes for the answer to this. That's a calculator, Rich. You're not going to tell me two minutes very well, is it? Two minutes to answer the question. And here, if you haven't studied this, you might not know, but don't worry, we're gonna, we're gonna find out. I mean, three marks is challenging here. I don't know. I don't know what those three marks are necessarily going to be. Most of the time, it's reasonably obvious to me what the marks are or should be. This one. Ten seconds. Well, I think I've got two. I don't know if I've got three. Okay, time's up. That was two minutes. It was quite tight. 
Again, a fairly advanced piece of exam technique or sort of answering technique. I'll just show you my answer there. So the first step is figuring out what the hell the question is about. That is difficult and probably the most fundamental. The second step is then answering the question with the information that we have. I just basically wrote down a very concise list of the things that I think are going to get me the marks. So I wrote DNA ligase, joins, sticky ends. The bits I've read in green, I added on to make it into sort of sentences. By, and then I wrote forms phosphodiester bonds, and then I put condensation reactions as like a hopeful mark to try and get, maybe it's a mark, probably not. And then I converted that into an answer by saying DNA ligase, full stop, join sticky ends by forming phosphodiester bonds in condensation reactions. Yeah, complementary base pairing is a great shout, actually. So the sticky ends are complex. I don't think this is about sticky ends. It's about the enzyme. But when we're fishing for answers like this, it's like, I don't really know what the answers are. Then I think complementary um, complementary base pairing between the sticky ends, yeah, very is very relevant, highly possible mark. DNA ligase. Complementary active site for the show. Okay, so complementary active site. Yeah, that's probably also useful um, for the shape of the primers. The sticky ends. So technically, if we look at a gene, if we had use that little sample that I drew before, um, if we've got these are unpaired bases here, the primer is actually part of the gene. So the primer would be it's not part of the sticky end. So just as a technical point there, but let's not worry about it too much. Um, yeah, we've got the for formation of phosphodiester bonds. Let's have a look at, well, let's do this next multiple choice because we'll see the answer when we go to the next page. Which of the enzymes, uh, this blue, which can be used to cut open the plasmid at stage two? DNA polymerase, RNA ligase, RNA polymerase, restriction endonuclease. That's a great question, actually, Josh. I'll sketch it out and I'll see if I can. There's not questions about where the active, I mean, the active site of. Yeah, I'll, I'll draw it in a way that I think will make sense to us. I'll do that next. But let's answer part two. A, B, C or D. OK, so we're cutting. Restriction enzymes or restriction endonuclease. You can use whichever version you want. It's nice to just recognize this in case we get a weird multiple choice question like this. But restriction enzymes, they do the cutting. They cut like this, which is how we end up with uh, sticky ends. Let's mark this, then I'll go and answer, try and answer the question about DNA ligase. Okay, so DNA ligase. We've recognized through our deep question analysis that we have to name the enzyme. Forms phosphodiester bonds. Again, this is how it, the question is just bad. And we will get badly written questions. Sadly, there is nothing we can do about that, especially if you do Edexcel, sadly. But learning, doing, the only way to really crack this is these classes where I'm gonna show it to you, but then practice. Like, what does this question bloody mean? Because without, without that, you're just going to waste, if, you, if you're not sure, you're going to waste a whole bunch of time writing stuff, which is not getting you marks. So then you're losing time and you're not getting marks. Just double catastrophe. Oh, a condensation reaction is in there. Ridiculous. Description of the role of the active site of the enzyme. Well done, whoever. Uh, Josh definitely got that in there. Or I, I didn't even occur to me, to be honest. Although... How an enzyme is involved, the active site, very much relevant to that. Honestly, more relevant than forms condensation reactions. It's not a good question. But with good analysis and good technique, we can still get, even if you get one or two out of three here, you're doing quite well because everyone else is going to be like, what? What? I mean, if we look at it on face value, explain how an enzyme is involved. Like, what on earth does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. It's ridiculous. Okay, let's see. This was yesterday's lesson. Have I got a lesson? Yeah, let's just 
get rid of that. Okay. You start with a double stranded piece of DNA. We take a restriction enzyme, which is going to blob on here, and we're going to cut DNA like this. So if we then extract, if I draw these in separate colors now, if I draw this DNA in blue, and this one can stay in black, so we now have a longer piece on the top with unpaired bases, single-stranded from that point. And then this one is longer on the bottom here with our unpaired bases here. These are obviously, if we use the same restriction enzyme, we have an A here, we know that we have a T here. We have complementary bases, the same number of bases. And so these are our sticky ends. So here, I guess I can draw the sticky end, the complementary sticky ends. If we use the same enzyme, we have complementary sticky ends. If you use different restriction enzymes, the sticky ends are not necessarily complementary. They might be different lengths. They might, they will have different base sequences because the active site of the enzyme was complementary to a different region on the, in the DNA. So we're confident with what sticky ends are. So we're then going to put this back together. Obviously, normally we cut different places of DNA and we insert, but I'm just going to use the same example here. So we have this. OK, so let's maybe zoom in here. Um, I probably can draw my sticky ends like this. OK, so what is DNA ligase doing? Well, DNA ligase is going to basically join up this phosphodiester bond. What do we, if we zoom in here, I suppose I'd actually be drawing it this way around. Uh, duh, 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 let's not do that in green. I've never actually drawn this, I suppose I'll do it in black because they're the nucleotides here. So we've got our deoxyribose and our base. What is, yeah, so I guess, mm, no, nope, I'm doing this. This is not very conveniently done. This bit here is where I want to be doing this if I'm going to draw in black. Oh. Okay, we're now in business. So now we have our, this bit of DNA, right the last base here, our base. And then we have our blue bit of DNA, which is going to be in the same orientation. So what DNA ligase is doing is forming that bond there to link this up. So you could think of its active site as being oh, that kind of shape and it's this bond here that it's making and this is actually the diff the reason why this is part of a polymer so this is actually has another one on here so on and so forth the dna ligase takes two strands of dna the my analogy last week was that our dna DNA polymerase adds one nucleotide at a time, like adding a single train carriage onto an existing train. DNA ligase takes two trains and connects them together. So this, um, this down here is a, a strand of DNA, a polynucleotide, and this is a strand of DNA, a polynucleotide, and it takes both of them and joins them together. And then you'd have the same happening here between that piece and that piece. Okay, so Samuel, yeah, in terms of the sequencing, this is another tricky thing about exam questions is that they don't necessarily have to give us, if I can go back to my document here. Yep, 
this is they have already been cut out before stage one we've cut out the gene for spider silk and we've cut out a, a resistance marker gene they've been so they've missed out there are steps that happened before stage one and so they did cut those genes. Or then maybe they produced those genes by other methods. We talked about reverse transcriptase last week. We talked about a gene machine just synthesizing a gene based upon, you know, its base sequence. Um, so essentially, yeah, that and that is quite common that the method that they they give us might be they might merge stages together. They might skip stages completely. And we've got to be like, oh, okay. So in which case here, we just got a gene. We didn't, if we'd started from the spider, we would have to extract the silk gene from the spider. We'd probably do that using restriction enzyme, or we'd do that reverse, using reverse transcriptase, or we'd do that by sequencing the gene and then just synthesizing it. Um, yeah, the phosphodiester bond is exactly that. It's between it's the between the phosphate and the deoxyribose. That is not particularly so that is the nucleotide, and then it's yeah, it's this bond. I'll do it in a different color so it stands out. Let's do it in orange. That's the bond that we're making. That it. Yeah, for I mean, I don't remember any questions about the active site of DNA ligase and how that works, to be honest. Um, in general, for enzyme active sites questions, um, you will say that the only time where I've seen that, let's go back here, only seen times I've seen that when with about DNA is um, with DNA replication. I'm now gonna draw my DNA strands vertically. In fact, let's do, okay, so this is a DNA. It's unwound by DNA helicase and we've got DNA is anti-parallel. So if our pentagons on our, uh, on our, nucleotides are point up here so the point of our pentagon is up here then on the other strand then we have oh, that's the wrong way around the nucleotides is the point down dna is anti-parallel and the dna the active site of dna polymerase is only complementary to let's actually start with there to the nucleotide in one specific orientation it can't take a nucleotide point pentagon pointing up and take a nucleotide pentagon pointing down because the active site of DNA polymerase, or in this case, um, DNA ligase, it doesn't really matter. It could come up as a question, I suppose, um, is only complementary to nucleotides in one orientation. It's like a left glove doesn't fit on the right hand. They are mirror images of one another, but they are, they are, you can't wear, you can wear it upside down, but if it was like a stiff glove, yeah, if it doesn't, wasn't that malleable, then they are enantiomers. Yeah, it left and right and are an enantiomers. That's not a biological key term. That's just a chemistry thing. Um, that's the active sites of enzymes are not necessarily. Um, I don't know if the chirality comes into it. Probably does it somewhere. Biology is bloody complicated. When we get down into it, okay. Okay, it's been a while since we looked at stage three. Why is antibiotic A, so reasons why antibiotic A is used in stage three for two marks, okay? So we insert an antibiotic gene for, and then they're placed inside the bacteria, which are exposed to by antibiotic A. So why is, why is the antibiotic used? Samuel, you do OCR, don't you? Okazaki fragments are not directly, you don't have to pull that out. Ask, can you ask me at the end? It's a more challenging question to answer. Generally, no. You might get asked why DNA replication is continuous on one strand and discontinuous on another strand. And I can explain that, although it typically is a bit complicated, but we can get there. 
Okay, two marks, two minutes, let's just go. Mm, two marks. Just cross it out so you can see what I wrote, but let's just do a cross. Okay. I started writing a bunch of waffle. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't bad, but it was just wordy. I kind of edited it to transformed is the name that we give to, or transgenic is the name that we give to an organism that has received genetic modification. It has DNA from multiple sources. So the non-transformed bacteria are killed. That was the most direct answer that I could give. In other words, only the transformed bacteria with the resistance gene and the spider gene will survive. And the antibiotic gene is a marker gene, which I thought was probably worth including. And then I kind of ran out of time because I'd written all this rubbish to begin with. So the only bacteria with the antibiotic resistant gene survive, therefore they also have the spider silk gene. Okay, so I, this is another really good example of like, I, my answering technique wasn't that great here. This bullet point, here only the transformed bacteria with the resistance and the spider gene survive that's both marks right there samuel i i'm pretty sure that both will be accepted then they're not looking they're very specific about use of key terms but like you can, so for example, OCR use phagosome instead of phagocytic vacuole for phagocytosis. If you write phagocytic vacuole, they're not going to mark you down. They are, so they're looking for accurate use of key terms, so it shouldn't matter, transformed or transgenic. I can double check, although that might take me a while to categorically rule out any possible options. Josh, have you studied marker genes before? This is a marker gene, essentially, that... You are going to take a bacterial cell. It is susceptible to the antibiotic. The antibiotic will kill it, kill it dead. She gone, right? We're going to insert the spider silk gene, but the spider silk gene is invisible in the bacteria. It's going to be visible when we make the plants express it. So we're using the bacteria here as a vector to actually insert the gene 
into the alpha alpha plants. So there's like two vectors going on here. We've got the plasmid is the vector to get the gene into the um, bacteria, and then we're using the bacteria to in, in infect the alfalfa plant, which is then going to get the DNA into the alfalfa plant's nucleus, which is then going to make the gene. So, but the spider silk gene in the bacteria is invisible. So we insert a gene that is visible or that we can detect quite simply with the spider silk gene because it's, the failure rate is very high. If you just try and gene modify these bacteria, many of them will die or many of them will not die and take not, but not take up the gene either. So they're just normal, effectively un-gene un edited uh, um, bacteria. So then we insert the antibiotic resistance gene with the target gene, in which case this is spider silk. We then expose them to the antibiotic, anything that didn't take on the genes or both genes, dead. Only the ones that have the antibiotic resi resistance gene survive, and therefore, ipso facto, they have the spider silk gene as well. And that's the one we care about, but we just can't detect for it. So that's what a marker gene does. It's either usually antibiotic resistance or it is um, fluorescence, something that you can like shine a UV light on, they'll fluoresce. And so you'll look at a bunch of bacterial colonies and be like, oh, these ones are fluorescing. They have the fluorescence gene, therefore, they have the gene that I wanted to put in as well. Yeah, radioactive. I mean, there's a few different ways. The principle is always the same, though. You add a gene that you can detect alongside the gene that you can't detect, but you want the functionality of. Yeah, if they survive, they definitely have both. They You can't get one but not the other of the gene. Either the piece of DNA that's inserted is either inserted into the nucleus correctly or not at all. You can't sort of have half of the genes inserted and half of them not, if they're on the same strand of DNA, in which case that's how this question started by saying we start by joining the spider silk to the antibiotic to make one piece of DNA that has them both. Um, you would definitely just assume that they are not. Um, there is a question that relates to that a little bit coming up. I think I might just skip to that now because we're coming up to towards the end of the time and I'd, I'd like to answer Samuel's question as well. <laughs> yeah, you'd assume that they're not. Yeah, the failure rate of inserting genes is high. So the success rate is quite low. And so by, by just doing the process, you don't necessarily guarantee that your target gene has been successfully inserted. I'm sure they're getting better at it, but certainly in the early days. Okay, let's go to that. Okay, so this is give reasons as opposed to explain why, I don't know, but that's what we have to do. Why the plants are grown in agar containing IAA. This is what, what's, what are the functions of IAA? causes cell elongation, promotes growth, it's a plant hormone, yada, 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 not to do with gene tech. We'll move on. Table shows the mass of spider silk produced from genetically modified alfalfa, shows the mass of spider silk produced from genetically modified goats, 10 kilograms per goat. A typical number of goats that can be kept on an acre of land is 12. Um, calculate the percentage increase produced by alfalfa compared with goats. So how many acres do we have? Oh, per acre, I'm assuming. Yeah, because it will be, so 10 kilograms times 12 equals 120 kilograms per acre. And then it's a percentage increase. So it's 218 minus 120 gives us the difference between them, which I'm going to call X. And it's a percentage increase from goats. So we divide that by the number in goats and times it by 100. So that's the equation and we get a percentage increase. The tricky thing there is just identifying that we want the increase. And so the number for goats goes on the bottom. Two reasons why some people may be concerned about the, the use of genetically modified alfalfa as a source of spider silk. Okay, so what might be some possible problems, uh, points of concern? here. These are quite repetitive. And it relates to oh, the marker gene. Let's give you that as a clue.
This is the most common one anyway. What did we do to the bacteria? We made it transgenic or we made it transformed. What did we give? What did we bestow upon this bacteria? We gave it the opportunity or the ability, genetically speaking, to make spider silk protein and to make it resistant to an antibiotic. Why might it not be a great idea to deliberately make bacteria resistant to antibiotics? Well, we have a huge issue with antibiotic resistance right now of them naturally evolving um, resistance. Bacteria can actually do this thing where they can pass plasmids between themselves. So plasmids can contain a gene, so they can actually say, here, have a gene from me. And so it sort of goes across, it's called horizontal gene transmission. That's great, it's not really in any of your specs anymore. It used to be, but it's not. Um, so that resistance, but those bacteria could pass on that resistance gene to other bacteria, which is the crux of this. And that is like, it's not very common, but it's definitely a source of contention. Yeah, and then potentially that has an impact on humans because let's say that ends up in a pathogen. We want to use the antibiotic as a medicine to cure us, solve an infection in a human. It doesn't work anymore because we've literally given the tool to not to be resistant to this thing. So let's just check out what that actual mark scheme answer was. A reason associated with health. Just such nonsense. Um, yeah, this could render human medicines uh, ineffective, could cost human lives. Pathogenic or back, but yeah, e.g., pathogenic bacteria could develop resistance. Okay, I'm going to try and answer. So the Okazaki fragments. Let's just get rid of all of this. I'm going to start with this again. I'd say you don't need to know certainly the name, the concept here. Resistance to the offspring. The reason why I think maybe not, I mean, no, actually that, that, that doesn't stand up because it's the same for both. Honestly, I don't, because it's like that mar marking point is pretty vague. Um, Really, I think it. We're not expected to know about Agrobacterium tumefaciens too much. I don't think they infect humans, but. I think certainly the sort of the escape of the resistance into a wider population and the really if it's not a pathogen of humans like right now there's a pathogen in me and it sucks right if it's humans it's just it's so why some people may honestly it 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 shouldn't it should be a point of concern even if it's if it's not a pathogen to humans in all honesty because spreading resistance out there it's not it's not a great practice to be doing so I don't think it really should be human centric, but likely that's where the answers and mark schemes are going to be. What is the impact on humans? They don't. The exams don't tend to focus too much on the ecosystem level. Well, that could be really bad for wild alpha alpha, alpha plants because maybe they get infected by tumor fasciens, and then we can't use an antibiotic. And not that we really use antibiotics on plants; it's not really a thing. But yeah, it could could escape into animals. Honestly, I don't know what their reason associated with health, whether that is human based or not. I don't have a great answer for you there. Amazon. I'd say in general, respond, assuming that we only care about humans. Okay, DNA replication. One thing that this is often confused with, because generally this is how I've drawn it, is we'll draw DNA replication like this, number one. And it looks like it's open. DNA is like unwound totally at one end. 
and that DNA helicase is unwinding the DNA and moving up and that the other ends are completely loose and free. That is not reality. What we end up with is this bubble. It's, can, it's joined at both ends, right? So if we assume that our DNA nucleotides are pointing face up in this direction, and therefore our nucleotides are face down in this direction, and that the active site of DNA polymerase is specific to a specific orientation, which way up the, um, the nucleotide is. This, is, this bubble is moving, right? So this we have DNA helicase operating to unzip the DNA here, and it's being wrapped up again there. That kind of happens naturally through the hydrogen bonding. So actually, I guess what I could do here, let's get rid of this. Let's go back here. Everyone understand my diagram that this is the same bit of DNA replication, but this is happening first. And then second, time is passing. Third, that my DNA helicase is unzipping the DNA here and it's wrapping itself up at the bottom end. Does that make sense to us? Both ends are closed always. And it's actually this bit that this bubble is moving up. So the bubble is moving in this direction, yeah? It's going up. So now let's say our newly formed DNA, I'll draw in blue, um, we've got, is gonna be anti-parallel to this strand. So this one is gonna be triangle pointing face down to form its complementary base pair. And let's say that this one, I actually can't remember off the top of my head which way, which orientation is right. But that's my DNA polymerase. And it can join and it can go. Hmm, I'm just going to move that actually. Oh, you are not going to let me copy that little thing. Okay. Start that again. Let's draw my black nucleotide on here. Okay, and then the new one that's forming is complementary to that. And then my DNA polymerase. Let's say that this one is going in this direction and it can just, so the bubble is opening up in front of the DNA polymerase. So it can just, as it's moving, it's going to track with the bubble. It's just going to continuously, it's like, great, I need to move on to the next nucleotide. Oh, the DNA bubble is still open in front of me. I'm going to move on to the next DNA nucleotide. Oh, the bubble has opened up in front of me and closed behind me. What happens on the other strand, though, is that, I guess, let's draw this one down here. We have our nucleotide black. Triangle pointing face down. And the new piece of DNA that's going to be formed is triangle pointing or pentagon, sorry, pointing face up. And now my DNA polymerase is going, if we look at this one, it's going in the direction of the flat base, right? In terms of its direction. I actually don't know if that's correct or not, but this one, is going in the direction of its fat base. It can only go in that direction because the active site of DNA polymerase is specific, but it's gonna hit a dead end here, right? It, that, that's, that's the end. So it does a little, what does it have to do? Well, it now has to sort of break off. It does a little, fra it does a little sequence and then it loops back up to the beginning where the bubble has just opened up and it does a little bit more. And so we end up doing this one because we keep hitting 
the tail end, we do this bit and then we do, we just we have to do it in pieces because it can only go in one direction. One of them is going with the direction of the bubble and one of them is going against the direction of the bubble. So it just hits the dead end and then it has to loop off, come back up and do the next section, then loop off, come back up and do the next section. And then we actually use DNA ligase to join the fragments together. D okay, so it doesn't, it splits the hydrogen. So imagine you've got, don't have anything here to demo with. You've got two pieces of sticky tape, essentially sticky side to sticky side. It's really long. Like you, DNA helicase is a bit like slipping your finger in between the two sticky sides bit of tape and like separating, but you're not separating the entire, imagine sticky tape, then you separated both strands. You've got these, giant long flailing arms of unpaired bases all looking to make hydrogen bonds with anything in sight it's just going to end up as absolute tangle imagine that was string that you had to keep organized way easier to keep the two ends sealed together and just open up a little pocket and then you do your work in that pocket and then everything sits, shuts back together again like if you do totally open out both ends you've just like dna is stable because it forms base pairs as soon as you make dna single stranded it is like just very unstable, very challenging to keep pace. That makes sense? Yeah, okay, so synth okay, on which strand though, Octavia? So on the, on, the, on the newly forming strand or on the original strand? This is why we have to be incredibly careful when we use three prime and five prime because reads three to five and writes five to and creates, synthesizes in five to three. Great, I'm learning something here. I wonder if we can, okay, so reading is fewer letters than synthesizing, and we start with the small number, we start with the three. So maybe if I can, that's how my brain is always making associations to help me remember things. So I think mean, this is superfluous for the most part, we don't really need to know. So reading DNA, three to five and then synthesizing as a longer word and we start with a bigger number and we go from five to three okay i would say no samuel you don't need to know the three prime five prime end but those that those fragments that are formed in the discontinuous length are um are, they are the okasaki fragments to answer your actual question And the, the what, which end is which? The five prime end is the phosphate end or the point of the pentagon, I think. I'm just gonna check that. The three prime end is the fat, the, the blunt end of our pentagon on the nucleotide, yeah. Yeah, other, yeah, exactly, because on the strand that's making DNA continuously, DNA polymerase is just it's making one long line. It doesn't need to draw anything together. But the, the one that keeps hitting the, the butt end of that, it's called the replication bubble, that hits the bottom of that replication bubble, it has to go back up and do the next little bit, then go back up and do the next little bit, and go back up and do the next little bit. We end up with these fragments, Okazaki fragments, but we don't need to know that. Um, and then how do we join two lengths of DNA together? then we need DNA ligase. It's the same enzyme, same as we use in gene technology. But on the continuous strand, we don't, we've got one piece. We've got exactly what we wanted. Like we've just made a continuous link. So we kind of went all over the plot there. Steph, well done for staying with us. So yeah, that, that kind of typical actually, as is my style. Going to try to give you exam technique focused sessions. If you ask questions, we can go to wherever your questions may take us. So, yeah, absolutely um, standard for my live classes. All the more reasons for coming to them live, because if you've got questions, I will try and answer them. I don't try to leave any question unanswered. Um, and really, I'm looking at trying to distill what is the question on about question analysis 
and getting, even if that's not perfectly clear, like I'm not always, some questions I look at and be like, I know exactly what this question wants and I know the answers, boom, boom, boom. That's ideal. Sure, that's lovely. That isn't always reality though. Even for me, who's been doing A-level bar exams for 10 years plus, sometimes I'm like, what does this question really want? Like how, what, but even if I don't know exactly, you can still increase your chances of getting marks by being really analytical with what the question is asking and not that doesn't mean if you've got confusion over the question write more waffle to try and fill the space that is right more points like what are the key terms surrounding this topic try to isolate what the actual topic of the question is what are those key points and then how can i get as many of them in as possible they don't do negative marking Unless there's a list, list two things that are boom, boom. You can't write five, not allowed. You can only write two. But for all other answers, you can write as many points as you want. Okay, great. Well, we will see you next week. Tomorrow's skill session is on repeatability and reproducibility. Uh, not tomorrow. Friday skill session is not a live one. Skill sessions, Octavia, are like a 45 minute activity. It's a pre-recorded video, typically about 10 minutes, where I set you up with an activity or I show you where to find questions. If there's divergence between the exam boards, I'll direct you to where to find those specific questions for your exam board. And then it will give you basically an activity to do to practice something that you probably haven't thought about as a theme of questions, as a style of questions that they're what I'm calling skills. So they are not directly mapped to a topic. Students will do topic revision all day, every day, but they won't look at uh, some of the things which are really important. 25% like of the marks are for essentially evaluate and suggest questions, which um, are challenging. Suggests, although suggest, I might do something suggest at some point, but suggests are really challenging. To get good at suggest questions, you need to get good at question analysis. That's where the suggests are marks are so essentially the live I'll, I'll show i'll just show you so you get an idea so from from the from the group tutoring sessions page from the lives here you've got the skills session let's just open that up so this was last week's i did on validity frequently get questions on that and so for this one there is a um a question pack which is this document and it gives you the instructions of what to do here. And it links you to um, the questions by type where if you want extension questions, then you can do them here as well. So um, that's what they are. So this is, yeah, you can see it's a six minute video. And then it, I probably say do questions for 45 minutes. It's like a, a, an activity, a revision activity on the topic that I've picked. Okay. And they're released on Fridays with the recording. So they're not live, but they are um definitely nice things to think about in terms of planning and covering dotting your bases dotting your i's and crossing your t's covering all your bases okay great we'll see you all next week on a monday for some more exam technique specialty focus